Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Nick Cage Fight Podcast, where every week we watch a Nick Cage film and wonder why, oh, why did they not let him keep the mustache for the whole runtime? I'm one of your hosts, Josh, joined as always by Rich and Ryan, where we're going to finish up reviewing the old way. How are we feeling? Feeling good. Feeling ready. Feeling feeling like a boss. I'm feeling, feeling like, like a, feeling like a Rooney. <laughs> I'm feeling a little surprised. I just found out that Clint Howard was in a new wave rock and roll band in the 80s called The Kempsters. Good that's, for him. That's surprising. I don't know that that's surprising, but I'm okay with it. That is an interesting tidbit. I can't seem to identify if he played an instrument or was the vocalist, but I will find out. Yeah, now we're going to have to watch some of his or listen to some of his music. God, I hope there's music videos. So where we last left off was the very funny wah, wah, my baby, my baby scene. And what we're treated to next is uh, the aftermath of that plan succeeding because the uh, Mm -hmm. deputy marshal approaches the marshal and the wounded men remaining in the posse. But as he gets closer, uh, we see that he is being held up at gunpoint by Briggs's daughter, Brooke. And Briggs comes in from, uh, he's like flanked around and he holds a gun on them as well. And they stick up the the remaining of the marshal's uh, forces. The one man with the uh, broken leg takes uh, some amount of offense at, at being held at gunpoint by a kid and threatens to shoot her. Uh, I think the quote was like, blow her brains all over this uh, valley. This provokes no emotion from Briggs at all. And the little girl <laughs> knocks the uh, the shotgun away and stomps on the man's broken leg <laughs> before disarming him. It it's pretty, pretty badass. And one of my favorite scenes uh, from her. I can't even remember what she says afterwards. She was like, oh, that was pretty easy or something like that. Very funny, though. So they tie up all of the marshal's posse, the remaining posse, and they set up camp. And uh, the marshal tries once again to uh, talk Briggs out of doing this whole thing. He is not convinced. The marshal is uh, balking at giving any additional information. So it looks very much like Briggs is intending to torture the marshal's men with the help of his daughter. Um, I mean, that's what it seems like to the marshal, but I knew what he was doing from like the, the jump as soon as he started talking about having to get the uh, the railroad spike red hot. Yeah, and as soon as he was trying to put the thing in the guy's mouth, I'm like, he's just performing surgery, bro. All right, well, then I'm the idiot they wrote the scene for because I was like, I don't know, maybe he's going to torture. I wouldn't put pe- anything past him at this point. He was going to shoot his kid dead. So torturing a couple of guys for the location of bandits did not seem bizarre at all. (laughs) I I didn't see any reason to doubt the direction the movie seemed to be leading us in at this point. Yeah, but also I kind of thought that this movie uh, at this point, I'm like, okay, this movie is fine. It's poorly written, though. So they're not going to have him. The most morally ambiguous they're going to have him be is when he pointed a gun at his daughter and decided not to do it, telling us, oh, he's a good person. And they're not going to backtrack on that midway through the movie. Or at the very least, he has his like dead wife as his moral compass. Sort of. He has to sort be reminded of, yeah. of it. He does have to be he reminded shoots of it. His kid. Oh, so it is. Uh, I did find out in the Kempsters, Clint Howard is the vocalist. And I did find some footage. Awesome. All right, we're gonna have to share that after we wrap this episode. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, for for uh, Patreon subscribers only. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, uh, the the reveal is they're not torturing this man. They're setting up for Briggs to dig the bullet out of his arm and then to cauterize the wound, so you know the man doesn't die. However, again, you know the uh, the marshal gives him all of the information he asks right before they go about performing uh, this field surgery. <laughs> tells them the name of the men in question the names of the men in question and where they're heading and why they think so and it has to do primarily with the uh, bandit leaders predilection for a particular barmaid in a particular town so at this point with the information that they need uh, uh, appropriately gathered Briggs threatens the marshal and tells him he's going to go check out this information and and if what he was told is false he's going to come back and kill all of the marshal's men Uh, before the marshal could get back with help. And so uh, Briggs and his daughter set off 
now with an additional horse and all of the guns that they took from uh, the marshal and his posse and leave, you know, the marshal and his men sort of abandoned uh, horseless without any of their firearms. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, Briggs does specifically point out that he is going to tie off the marshal's horse that he has stolen in the town because he, quote, ain't no horse thief. That's right. I'm only a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. Not something real despicable, like somebody who'd steal another man's horse and not return it. We cut to uh, the bandits who get to a, a little town where the, the bandit leader has stashed some cash. They dig up this little lockbox, but all of uh, the bills are uh, Mexican tender. So the bandits are a little bit pissed off about this. Uh, but the bandit leader, who, again, this guy does play this character pretty charismatic and and uh, vaguely threatening in basically everything he says. It's, it's pretty well done. Uh, but he does talk them around because he says, look, at, you, you just broke me out of prison. Uh, we killed this lady. We're going to have to lay low for a little while. And this is a ton of money across the border. But the money on this side of the border isn't really worth anything unless you know where to go to spend it. And I do. So just stick with me through this and your cut of this loot will be valuable to you. So uh, having uh, narrowly avoided uh, some type of mutiny, we cut back to uh, Briggs and his daughter and we get a weird speech uh, regarding Briggs's affinity towards dead people because they quote, don't need anything anymore and they're fine. This is, this is uh, prompted by uh, Briggs pulling up a rough wooden crucifix uh, from a grave and the daughter having some things to say about this uh, because it belongs to somebody. Um, and that's when, uh, you know, Briggs gives her a very weird childhood talk about mortality uh, a little bit odd. I kind of like the phrasing he uses for it. The, the dead don't need anything they've already been tended to. Yeah. I, I think that was a pretty okay bit of uh, character writing for him. It is intriguing. Uh, the more we get a sense of his worldview, <laughs> yeah. uh, the more interesting his character is. But again, I think I think Cage was phoning a lot of this in. It's good that his character, it worked for his character to seem perpetually annoyed at everything and not much more emotion uh beyond that because you know it, it it plays but it's very apparent that that cage seemed done with this um yeah, well so this is actually my theory on this is that during filming it filmed in october and november the incident with the armor from rust happened relatively early in filming and i think because he had to be convinced to come back I think that he was probably angry, felt unsafe, and was like, fuck it, I am just phoning this in. I'm coming off of the unbearable weight of massive talent, which everybody fucking loved. I'm going in to do Renfield, which everybody is going to fucking love. Nobody is going to remember this movie. That is fair. This is 2023, Nick Cage. He's no longer in his uh, starving, uh, having to pay back the IRS and shit phase. So, um, I mean, he's still doing a fuck ton of movies, but oh, yeah, I, I, because I, I do think that's kind of ingrained in him to just uh say yes to a bunch of stuff because I just think he genuinely likes acting. Yeah, Christopher um, Walken does that too. He has a running order to never say no to anything unless that there's a uh, scheduling conflict. That's how he ended up in Joe Dirt. That is specifically how that happened yes <laughs> i i do unironically love that movie too <laughs> i mean yeah it's great it's joe dirt yeah it's um, probably how he ended up in uh what's that one with brendan Fraser where it's like the fucking fallout basically and but instead of the uh vaults opening up after like the bombs drop it's just fucking like the 90s now i a, don't a blast from the past that's what okay. that movie's called yeah oh I've there never seen that. You've never seen that? It's great. It's uh, Christopher Walken has a fallout vault and he just hides his kid and his wife in there because he thinks that the nukes are dropping in the 50s and uh, it's the 90s when it opens. <laughs> uh, I've got to check that one out. So the bandits, uh, having secured uh, their loot, ride into the town uh, with the particular tavern that the bandit leader likes to frequent. 
and they set up a watch to try and catch Briggs uh, coming up on, you know, where they're uh, camped out in town. Uh, and the leader goes to sleep with some prostitutes, presumably. I'm not entirely sure. I'm he, very sure that they were supposed to be prostitutes. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's possible, though. So from there, we cut back to Briggs and his daughter, and they're around a campfire. And the daughter is asking questions about Briggs's life before uh, he settled down with her mother and had her. And he tells an even more fucked up series of stories than the marshal did earlier in the film. This poor girl has just got adults that do not know how to interact with children at all no. throughout the entire course of this film. <laughs> but <laughs> essentially, we get uh, the, the, the whole uh, speech is positively uh, unhinged in general. But uh, Briggs details the fact that uh, he had no concept of fear or being scared of anything. And then at some point in his life, he realized that he could manipulate other people's fear specifically of him and use that to his advantage. And he tells a story again to his daughter, his very young daughter, about how one time a guy who was a friend of somebody that Briggs had killed uh, came up on him while he was taking a bath, completely vulnerable. And the man looked scared and was shaking and couldn't pull the trigger. So Briggs got out of the bath took the gun from him and shot him dead with it. Um, a great story to tell your child. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that being said, again, uh, the daughter and uh, Briggs are very similar in their particular issues with human emotions. So uh, she actually uh, uh, tells him that, you know, she feels pretty similar. And uh, he, he does also emphasize like learning how to act like normal people uh, so as to not be ostracized. Um, and she uh, finishes story time by asking him to teach her how to shoot in the morning. And he does. Now, this is a pretty good scene that I liked anyway. He's teaching her how to shoot. She has one of the rifles, long guns, and she's trying to shoot um, at a hat that they've uh, propped up on a post. She isn't a super good shot with the rifle. And you can clearly see she's struggling to like heft the weight of it. So I mean, guns are heavy. That makes guns sense. are heavy. And yeah. she is, again, a little kid. So. She asks if she could try the pistol instead. And then we cut to them riding away and she's got the hat that was on the post on her head and has several bullet holes drilled through it at this point. So uh, we're assuming she was a, a better hand at the pistol than the long gun. Fun scene. I like that one. Back in town, uh, Eustace, uh, the, <laughs> the oldest bandit in the group uh, who was bullied into taking first watch, uh, wakes up from his post he's like sleeping against some low outer wall of this town uh, and realizes nobody relieved him from watch the night before so he storms into the tavern to complain about this so the bandit leader is sitting at the table eustace is complaining that nobody came and relieved him of duty bandit leader calls out uh, boots and big mike who are like well why didn't you just come and get one of us and he's like oh i didn't want to uh, leave my post but essentially uh, Eustace outs himself that he fell asleep on watch uh, and the bandit leader is not particularly pleased by this and he breaks one of Eustace's fingers uh, in retaliation and tells him that he did him a favor because the next time he feels like falling asleep on watch he can just squeeze his broken finger and that'll wake him the hell up so which is what it's this that I think that's one of my favorite scenes though of Eustace just running in and trying to explain himself because Clint Howard does awkward snitching on himself very very well he does it in Austin powers he does it in the water boy and it's always funny i agree entirely the the putting uh your foot in your mouth scene he he is a, a master class at that <laughs> so briggs and uh brooke come upon the town but briggs is 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 trying to reason out a strategy because the bandit leader clearly knows who he is and he has no idea who this guy is so they'll see him coming, but he won't be able to tell, you know, who the bad guys are in this particular scenario. So while they're wondering, you know, what they should do to uh, counteract this disadvantage, all of a sudden uh, an ad plays. Oh, you got him. Because I was just uh, I was saying like, man, I wish I was saying this because I know what I'd say. And then Josh, you <laughs> fucking killed it. You fucking killed you it. That is, <laughs> that is exactly 
exactly how I was going to play that. There you go. Great minds. Think alike and buy products and services. Buy products and listen to these podcasts unless they're about Lancaster or BYU. However, if you ever go to Lancaster, check out the Chameleon Club. It's actually pretty cool. Like the city of Lancaster is not the worst place in the world. I'm not sure if it was Lancaster, but I, did I did I tell you guys I, I went to a Pennsylvania Ren Fair like about two years back, and one of the guys it was like a, a bunch of people I played video games with uh, online. So I was meeting a lot of them for the first time, and one of the guys was uh, lived in Pennsylvania, and he's like, "For breakfast, we gotta go to this place called a uh, Smorgasbord." Okay, and he's like, "It's awesome. You got to check it out." He ended up ditching breakfast the next day, and we ended up going to this place. And it was not great. I apologize to any smorgasbord fans out there. It's just like a gigantic breakfast themed old country buffet. Oh, no. With a massive Amish market downstairs from the restaurant. But this place was so fucking packed. Like the line to get in where you like pay the buffet fee and stuff. It was set up like the entrance to Six Flags. There's like 15 different lines you can get in and they're just funneling people into like the seating area and shit and all just like generally lackluster breakfast food <laughs> look if it's Oof. not a vegas buffet i'm just not gonna be about that life i mean i fucks with the asian buffets because usually they got that good crawfish like i like a big bucket of crawfish frog legs dude frog legs absolutely frog legs are amazing it's, I'm, I'm, ask, I'm much more a... tame just give me a big old like just give me the whole ham yeah, <laughs> so I, I will this, say uh, this: Ren Fair, the the one that's kind of like an uh, like attached to a winery slash brewery kind of one. I'm not sure. It's one of those things where it doesn't look like it was a pop up thing. It looks like they just run the Ren Fair there every year. Yeah, okay, that that's the one I've been to a couple of times. Okay. I, I, I like that. I will say this in in Smorgasbord's uh favor: the I I had an overwhelming sense of Americana when I went to use the bathroom. Uh, at the end of our meal because I you heard the description of how you get into this place the bathroom was gigantic and in the men's room I don't I don't think there were even urinals in there there was just like 50 stalls side by side with floor to ceiling doors almost all of them were full occupied and just the cacophony of a bunch of grown men shitting loudly was deafening that's like, America, baby. This is fucking America. You just gorge yourself on all you can eat fucking sausages and eggs and shit and then go shit your brains out surrounded by your compatriots. Well, look, as as somebody who uh, has a thing about taking a shit in uh, unknown toilets is what I call them. I do appreciate that because one of the things that helps is the floor to ceiling door. All, I mean, also sound cover is usually uh, uh, appreciated, but you wouldn't have heard somebody getting murdered over the sounds <laughs> of violent shitting in this place. It was <laughs> absurd. I've never, ever seen anything like it before in my life. <laughs> God damn. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> go to Smorgasbord for the food, stick around for the shitter. <laughs> <laughs> and skip the Amish market thing. I'm, I'm telling you, underneath the restaurant, I, it was bigger than the restaurant, this Amish market. It was it was wild. Yeah, but like there, just to tell a quick story, then get back to Nick Cage. Like uh, a band I was in, we were planning to like go on tour. And uh, one of the things that I had to explain to them is that I can't shit at a rest stop. So they're just like, okay, each like this night, we're going to like stay like in our car, like in our van. And I'm like, no, that can't happen. I need some sort of hotel room every night even if it is a will you will get murdered here motel because i need somewhere to shit in peace i will hold my shit in for three days see that's fucking crazy because some people say one of my best qualities is being able to shit anywhere at any time <laughs> i, I wish imagine. i had i wish i had that ability i don't gotta learn how to hover man i don't think that would help i don't think it would help it's more of an ambiance issue. I think so. I think it's more of a like I need, I need to chill. I need to be on my phone. I need to browse Reddit. I, I need mean, to gotta, like. Gotta, I'm gotta, gonna. 
You got need good noise canceling headphones. You got to bring a candle in there with you. Yeah, there's a lot. Actually, I might, I might, I might uh, start experimenting with some of that. Yeah. Let's see, now I know what I'm going to get you for Christmas, Rich. It's just going to be an emergency shit kit, and it's going to have <laughs> noise canceling headphones, a tiny, tiny candle, book of matches, <laughs> a little I, like that, battery operated water feature or something like that. <laughs> that Ooh, might I help. love those. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try. Little, little just... tiny waterfall. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> hey, look, it could be worse. I once worked at a restaurant with a kid. And I, I remember we've the talked middle... about this before. Yes. Yeah, All the right, kid yeah. that has to get so, completely buck-ass naked. Yeah, he, he had to yeah. go home to shit because he shit with no clothes on 100% of the time. No variation. Always at his home. I'm assuming he had similar difficulties traveling as, as you, Rich. <laughs> yeah, you need that privacy. Okay, there you go. Um, I, I I hope I hope Lancaster and Ad played for that. <laughs> yeah, wow. Right this this really stories. this really went off on a tangent. Back to Nick Cage. Yes. So Briggs' daughter actually raises uh, a solid possibility for a plan that the uh, the bandits wouldn't know who she was, and as far as they know, that you know the bandits wouldn't have any particular knowledge of her specifically. So she can go into town, get the lay of the land. And report back to Briggs. So he coaches her on what she needs to do. She needs to ride in, go to the mercantile shop, explain that, you know, she needs to buy something. She lives on a farm nearby and her parents sent her to purchase something and then casually ask if uh, any new people have showed up in town recently, just like shooting the breeze. So she we actually get this uh, the instruction narrated over the scene of her riding into town. And so she goes into the uh, mercantile shop and in another great, great scene, she recites word for word the rambling nonsensical story from the patron to Briggs's mercantile shop at the beginning of the film. <laughs> and at the end of it, which has uh, specific references to specific people and places in their town that are not this town so at the end of it the owner of the shop is like who is mr smith what, what are you what are you talking about <laughs> unfortunately for her it's so good yeah it's 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 pretty funny uh, but unfortunately for her as she exits the shop with uh, her bag of flour uh, the bandit group is waiting for her right outside so the bandit leader takes her to the tavern that they're um, uh, hiding out in, and he plans with his fellow bandits to set up an ambush for Briggs. You know what's funny that just occurred to me? They talk about uh, Briggs needing to get into the center of town and see some addendum they made to a sign, and I don't think we ever fucking see that sign. No. No um we do i think it's the the sign for the saloon it says paid in full oh okay i Good. think that's what they're talking about has to be because it the the it ties back to the i owe you more but it just occurred to me that i never noticed what the fucking sign he was supposed to see actually said i, was, I wasn't sure if they forgot to put it in or if they edited it out for some reason but i must have just missed it yeah i think it's that it's you can see it in the big showdown at the end Okay, there you go. So uh, the bandit leader is uh, referring uh, to Brooke as his little sister, uh, introduces her that way to his preferred uh, tavern maiden lady, girlfriend, prostitute, not entirely sure. And then he goes to explain uh, to her why he considers them to be siblings. And that's because since Colton Briggs murdered his father, the confirmation that hasn't been explicitly stated this thus far in the film this is the grown-up little kid from the first scene 20 years prior and at the at the end of his recitation of why he considers them siblings the kid has a great line where she goes oh i see now you're crazy (laughs) (laughs) a a little uh a little overused a little tropish but uh, this this actress delivers it uh pretty well yeah, she's she's good. It, you know, doing what needs to be done to play this uh, neurodivergent character. Yeah, yeah it kind of no, has I, me I, stoked I like to check out. It, it kind of has me stoked to check out that uh, fire starter remake. You'll have to let me know if that's worth watching because I'll, I'll I'll never seek it out myself. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, like it's a Stephen <laughs> King adaptation. I'm contractually obligated to watch all of those. <laughs> 
We've signed too many contracts, I think. We have signed so many contracts regarding films and what we have to watch. <laughs> yeah, man. And the fact that if we break those contracts, they confiscate our eyeballs, I'm not a big fan of. But No, I need man, those to see. Hey. I need those to watch the good trash. <laughs> That's showbiz, baby. <laughs> so at a, 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 after some indeterminate period of time passes, Briggs realizes something has gone wrong with the plan, uh, and he decides... Uh, to go see what happened so he's riding up towards town and one of the lookouts uh big mike sees his approach and backs into the door of a, a, a building that he was standing outside of and shortly thereafter we see a riderless horse uh run by uh the front of this building and then a uh, big mike comes sort of flying out the doorway because uh briggs has circled around entered the building from behind and stabbed big mike uh in the back <laughs> he follows big mike out removes the knife from his back and then cuts his throat very unceremoniously oh one thing i, I do want to point out is uh eustace is on top of being the punching bag for the uh the bandit crew is also the only one with any real brains when it comes to to colton briggs and his uh well-earned reputation um, because he does explicitly advise everybody to, if they see Colton and have a chance to shoot him dead, to do so immediately instead of putting themselves all at risk for this elaborate uh, revenge scheme uh, that the uh, the bandit leader has concocted. Nobody listens to his advice. So uh, after Big Mike has had his uh, throat slit, the town square sort of erupts into uh, gunfighting. We get a, a brief cut back to the bandit leader and Briggs's daughter where the bandit leader is making a bunch of uh, fake stacks of money out of his stash and putting a couple of, of stacks of bills into his personal saddlebags and he indicates that this is some sort of insurance policy for him in case uh, his crew tries to abscond with a majority of the loot uh, that he had promised them. So with the, uh, the, the gunfighting uh, breaking out, uh, the bandit leader goes to lead the daughter out at gunpoint while uh, the rest of the bandit crew try and flush uh, Briggs out into the open uh, where he can be disarmed uh, or taken out. However, uh, Briggs manages to outflank the impatient bandit Boots, who is combing through the town with Eustace, and Briggs shoots Boots dead. But Eustace actually manages to wing Briggs in return, scoring the first real hit against Briggs that we've seen so far in the film. So good on you, Eustace. Uh, you I'm proud it. of him. Yeah, no, me too. I, I, I like to think that that was a very deliberate choice since, again, Eustace is the only one with uh, what I consider to be actual brains <laughs> in the Bandit crew. Yeah. So... Um, after uh you know after winging or getting winged uh briggs uh flees inside the building and the um bandits sort of regroup around the leader uh and eustace explains that you know boots is dead he winged briggs briggs is hiding in this one building and but we actually see briggs run across the street uh, at this point and hole up i think in the mercantile shop uh but the uh the bandit leader sends two you know no name new additions to his crew uh recruited in this town to go also um, known and... as two dead guys yeah exactly um but uh tries to get them to go flush briggs out and um you know bonus points for bringing them out alive uh of course uh briggs immediately kills the uh the two no names off screen you just hear the two gunshots and uh so then the uh the bandit leader calls briggs out to settle their differences in the street the old way i it. said it this is where they say the name of the movie my favorite um, part of any movie yep so i i guess the idea is to have like a good old-fashioned uh gunfight uh in the middle of the street and so briggs comes out with his pistol drawn uh, he looks pretty badass but he stumbles as he's going down the steps so it's clear he's been wounded and so now we we have the final confrontation. Eustace is uh, holding uh, the girl hostage with a shotgun, I believe, and threatens uh, to to shoot her if 
uh, Briggs doesn't lower his weapon. Uh, so Briggs holsters his pistol. So uh, the head bad guy launches into another monologue. This guy loves monologuing. And he goes on about how he remembers Briggs and is disappointed that Briggs doesn't recognize him uh, and basically rehashes the backstory about, you know, Briggs shooting his father dead, so on and so forth. So he lays out how this is going to work. They're going to have a duel. And if Briggs shoots the bandit, uh, Eustace is going to shoot um, his daughter. Uh, otherwise, Briggs has to let himself be killed by the bandit in front of his daughter, uh, poetic justice for what he did to this kid back in the day. And then also, for some weird reason, uh, the bandit leader is going to then adopt the kid in some strange fashion uh, to take uh, Briggs's place. Yeah, that that whole part was a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not elaborated on enough to be like a cogent story beat. Yeah, it really isn't. It just this guy seems just crazy and angry. Yeah. And of dubious moral character. So Briggs, basically seeing how this is going to have to play out, uh, turns to Brooke and says, what is it? I have everything I need. Make sure I'm tended to basically reiterating his speech uh, about uh, the dead from earlier in the film and then quickly draws uh, his pistol and shoots uh, Eustace, uh, killing Eustace, poor Eustace. But this gives to a real one. Yeah. But this gives the bandit leader Mm -hmm. uh, the opportunity to shoot him in the chest and Briggs collapses. And I did find this kind of funny where like the bandit leader is in a bit of disbelief is so that this worked. He's like, I fucking did it. (laughs) Like I did it. I killed Colton Briggs. Holy shit. I love it when a plan comes together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, his surprise is such as like you didn't think this was gonna work when you said yeah down. no he was so incredible I I was happy for him to be honest I was like you know what dude good for fucking you yeah he pulled it off it looked he it got looked like there you weren't for a minute there but uh you managed it uh but not really uh because Brooke grabs Briggs's pistol and shoots the bandit leader directly in the chest uh which prompts him to look at her with fresh eyes. And go, oh, it was you, it was you all along. You're the monster. And she shoots him right between the eyes um, and puts him down uh, for good. Uh, Solid move. Good for her. Yeah, exactly. So Briggs hands over uh, his pocket watch that he has checked several times throughout the course of the film and tells his daughter to to listen to her mother. Like, she won't steer wrong. Um, And we can see inside uh, the front face of the pocket watch is a picture. Um, uh, okay, his wife. is that picture in color? I thought that was a fucking color picture when I saw it. I could be mistaken. I'm... I don't remember. I will confirm right now. Okay, because it I, it was I either thought it was color, black and white. It might have been black and white, but I know there was something about that picture that was like scratching my uh, my ire about it being anachronistic to the uh, the period. I mean, also I, I didn't mention it when we were talking about it, but the the fucking jelly beans were too vibrantly colored for that time frame. There were jelly beans back then, but I don't think food coloring was developed at that high of a pigment count. Mm. Yeah, I don't know a lot about the history of jelly beans, but... They were introduced at a World's Fair in Boston in 1951. Huh. 1951? Or 1851. I was about to say then... Yeah, no, no, about 100 years before that. Okay. Sorry, I had to check you on that one. Okay, so... This is where the film abandons its own premise, basically. And in my opinion, is a big missed opportunity because Briggs expires, um, having sacrificed himself to save his daughter and complete uh, their revenge trip. But this actually causes uh, Brooke to cry for real, which doesn't make sense to me. This was supposed to be the thing that she lacked regardless. I, I don't think one quick revenge trip over the course of like what maybe three days at most was enough to bond to this gruff man that is always just generally mean and their interactions seemed relatively limited up until now but you know she cries over his body and falls asleep there and uh is eventually woken by the marshal sometime later the marshal and his men have uh finally caught up 
and one of the marshal's men, one of the marshal's new men, I suppose, uh, finds the lockbox with uh, all of the uh, the uh, Mexican money in from inside the tavern. And so, uh, Brooke and the marshal have a little bit of a conversation as to you know what happens now. And the marshal's like, well, you know, I could uh, explain that you know your father and you. Uh, held us at gunpoint and robbed us and left us to, for dead in a desert after stealing our horse and our guns, in which case, you know, they would uh, uh, take you and question you for a bit and then bring you back home to figure out what to do with your, you know, your daddy's shop. He said, or, you know, I could tell them that uh, you and your daddy saved the lives of one of my men by performing field surgery. And uh, I can't remember if it was like, it was like, and then you were deputized and your father was defending himself uh, against this bandit when unfortunately he was critically wounded, you know, um, in, in, in the fight to take him out. And then you go back home and figure out to do with your daddy's shop. And, you know, since the outcome is the same either way, maybe if you agree not to mention this uh, strong box filled with money to anybody, uh, we play it that way. And the girls just like, uh, you know, does that does that mean my dad will be a hero? And the marshal looks her dead in the eye and says, uh, here are some more ads. That was so good. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> it hurts how good that was. <laughs> I knew that's where it was going because, again, we are on the same brave length. And I'm like, that's what I would do. <laughs> I want to <sighs> figure out the next, like, like, Ideo- ideologically diametrically opposed to all of our views uh advertiser we could have jump in and drop a commercial in the middle of one of our episodes i'm not sure is uh is that 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 weird patriot coffee thing still a thing I don't yeah know black, what that black was. rifle right oh yeah yeah black i, I was gonna say gun coffee <laughs> remember gun coffee is that still a thing yeah gun, gun coffee is caffeine. still a thing <laughs> it, I, I think i don't think i heard about this it, it it has like three times the caffeine so you can stay up longer hating Mexicans. <laughs> oh, so it's just bad Death Wish coffee. Yes, like it is like extra caffeine so you can be extra racist. And all of it has like the troops or like police badges on the fucking bags and stuff like that and stupid pithy names for it and stuff. Oh, largest possible yike. <laughs> like shotgun yeah, it's not blast great. cold brew. Shit uh, like that. Let's Let's take a look. I'm gonna... Kill my algorithm. <laughs> Black Rifle Coffee. <coughs> Black Rifle Coffee Loyalty Roast. Fun fun little anecdote about Black Rifle Coffee. I just recently saw an article about how one of the employees at the company beat like one of the owners in a uh, shooting competition, did better than him or something like that. And this guy lost his fucking mind and just sexually harassed this dude for months afterwards. Oh, and they're also selling, like, coffee mugs that are like, caution, I have no filter. I'm going to say the (laughs) N-word. Good God. Yeah, I'm looking at their website. This is some uh, held-together-by-duct-tape shit we got going on here. (laughs) Yeah, and it also looks like they kind of transitioned into, like, suburban wine moms. Yeah, that's exactly the the vibe I'm getting here. I mean, like... I, I'm absolutely exhausted by the commodification of political divide between this and the dude selling like seven dollar chocolate bars with uh, pronouns on them. I'm losing my fucking mind here. I thought you were going to say Mr. Beast. <laughs> no, that's a that's a whole different conversation. Because like I know people are like, oh, oh, so you hate you know somebody doing nice stuff for people. It's like, no, it's not, that's not, not that. Yeah. It's... That's not the part I don't like. Like I actually find Mr. Beast to be a little bit more complicated than like I don't like him because of A or B. It's like you don't like the system. What he is doing is a net good, I think. But it's like he's possible. just doing it in the most annoying way possible. Uh, I think there's an e- there's an air of exploitation to everything he does because he is profiting I agree. off of it. But like, it's... yeah, I think he is actually helping more than he's hurting for the most part. 
he, here's the problem with that. It's it's explicitly exploitative because he's making more money than he's spending doing these stunts in the first place. Also, he I'm almost positive he dropped out of high school to study YouTube for like 18 months before launching his career and and accomplishing this shit. And yeah, because like most of his early videos are like him playing with fucking fidget spinners or eating food all fucked up. Also, you can't you can't do these overwhelmingly philanthropic acts and just collect glory and money as a result of it without addressing the systemic realities that make that kind of philanthropy impactful as a weird catharsis stand-in form of entertainment. It's kind of gross. Right. I agree with everything you just said. I The only thing I'm saying is that I do think that if you just take him into account and not the system around him, I think it's a net good. Yeah, I'm 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 happy people are getting surgeries they need or shoes they need or food they need. I think it's the the gross part is some guy cashing in on doing that shit. Yeah, the fact that we need some jerk off who used to just play with fidget spinners on yes. YouTube to do that is kind of the issue. Right now, if yeah. he's taking said money that he's making and giving people more surgeries because we live in a fucking hellscape, uh, fine. Like, until there is a better system, fine. And also, but his whole he brand goes against relies... The wall. What was that? But he, he goes against the wall at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm yeah. just saying, it, it it is in his best interest for these inequalities to remain because without it, he would not have content. It would not Correct. be interesting at all. So he is literally requires the system to be this shitty so that they can do feel good shit about it it reminds me of all those fucking news stories where it's like uh this you know a uh, 65 year old person who's still working because they have cancer and can't afford uh their own treatment unless they keep working until they die their community came together and bought them a car so they don't have to walk to work anymore that is not feel good that or is- or like Poor 12 year old child sells lemonade to help pay for yeah parents cancer treatment yeah, that's that sort of shit. I I don't find that to be heartwarming in any way, shape, or form. So no, anyway, there not. you go. We commented on some some uh, uh, current relevant topics. I hope you're fucking happy. <laughs> we did this podcast explicitly just to talk about nonsensical westerns uh, that Nick Cage happened to star in, where he plays an autistic cowboy. Okay, that's that was the goal here. Oh well, yeah. I mean, that was always the goal. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I hope our ad is for the Black Rifle Coffee. No, it's going to be for the Mr. Beast Burger. <laughs> That's I, I hope. Well, I mean, that would work, too. We're going to we're going to curse ourselves like again, like I said, with just advertisement that we are diametrically opposed to. So it's kind of funny that the algorithm does that when we're clowning on this stuff. I do appreciate the irony there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're basically being paid to dunk on these douches. It reminds me of now, of course, we're we're not uh, successful enough to be able to like get deals where they let us do an ad read ourselves instead of just inserting. But it reminds me of uh, Norm McDonald's uh, ad reads when he, he had that like web show where he interviewed people and had them, you know, re read like pre done jokes on notepads and stuff like that. He had some weird like as seen on TV grilling device that he was pushing and they eventually pulled the ads from him because it was bonkers every time he had to talk about that product (laughs) eventually they had enough but back to the story oh wait real quick we we just finished an ad read what's our patreon again (laughs) we talked about black rifle coffee for 10 minutes yeah (laughs) patreon.com slash nick cage fight three dollar tier will make it so um that you never have to drink Black Rifle Coffee. No, it, it, the the $3 tier, uh, if you subscribe for six months, you can put in a request on our email and we will come to your house and spit cold brew directly into your mouth. Should I, I should actually mention what it actually does. Uh, you get all these episodes uh, without these advertisements. You still get our banter and our fake advertisements, uh, but not the real ones that you have to like skip through because they're real annoying. Uh, you don't get those. And then there's other tiers too, where you get like bonus episodes where we'll be, we'll be watching The Wrestler. We'll be watching coming The Wrestler soon. coming soon and some other movies. We're going to do a live stream too. I think I got that all figured out at this point. 
We have oh, not yeah. contacted lawyers about it. It might be the last thing we do, but it'll be damn fun. No, no, I, I, I think mean, the I, worst thing that'll happen is we get a C and D for that specific thing. We can start right, and then it's podcast. like, okay, cool. It already happened. It'll be like the time Jim Morrison was on the Tonight Show, where he said the word "hire" numerous times, and they said, "You're never going to play the Tonight Show again." And he's like, "Who cares? We already did." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we'll represent ourselves pro se and just cover, switch to covering uh, us trying to take on the illegal system. That'll be fun. Oh, yeah. We'll have to see if uh, Cage played a lawyer in any film. I don't think oh, he seen... definitely has. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. I'm we'll going to find out that. right now. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to watch that to prepare ourselves. Yeah, no, I can tell you the movie. It was Space Jam. <laughs> Um, it's called Seeking Justice. It's from 2011. Of course he was a lawyer. <laughs> oh, speaking of real oh, quick. Oh, wait, what? No, never mind. If That's just a legal thriller starring Nick Cage. He plays an English teacher in that. Fuck. I, All right, give I me another saw, minute. I saw in the dollar store today, you could buy one DVD that had four Nick Cage movies on him. Did one you of which buy we, it? I didn't, and I should have, because one of the movies was Bad Lieutenant. <laughs> Oh, uh, the, man. The other one was, uh, what's the bad dystopian one we watched? Uh, Humanity, Humanity Bureau. Bureau. Yes. It had that one on it, too. And then two other movies we haven't watched yet. I forget what they were. But I remember seeing Bad Lieutenant. I'm just like, I'd buy this if I had a DVD player. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fair point. So but if either of y'all want to go to Dollar Tree, it's there. I will do that, actually. Yeah, I might do that, too. <laughs> Um, so circling back to the, the the plot of this film, uh, the marshal and and Brooke come to an agreement um, that he'll spin the appropriate tale about Briggs. And uh, the girl asks if that means her dad will be remembered as a hero. And the marshal says yes. And she seems uh, very happy with this, saying to you know Briggs's corpse that you know Mama would be proud. Blah blah blah. However, we do get one last. Uh, cold-hearted move from her where she is clever enough to steal the uh, bandit leader's saddlebag that he put a bunch of the money from the strong box into uh, before the shootout and then credits roll C, An C minus flick. what was that C minus yeah, yeah C minus I can't find a movie that he played a lawyer in so I guess I was uh mistaken we'll see I and mean, we'll find out by the end if he ever plays a lawyer but yeah no this this movie wasn't great it wasn't terrible. It had some decent moments in it. It had some decent acting in it. I do really like, I know, um, you know, you guys might have your own picks for uh, most unhinged scene, but Nick Cage shaking in anger <laughs> as he's just dealing with a routine local regular customer. Like he has an account at the store and just being fucking furious in that whole scene had me dying laughing that yeah was that was good. pretty good there wasn't a whole lot because again he it seems like he just kind of phoned this one in which yeah. i don't really have a problem with if you know this story not if the story is true because we know it's true but if he was that upset by it then like yeah i get it yeah no i agree but like i said really you know just 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 a bit of a blip they they made this whole movie on a single premise um, and then didn't bother to flesh that out in any real meaningful way. Uh, and then sort of just toss the concept uh, by the wayside at the very end. She could have been super cold and calculating, negotiated the, uh, you know, the, the story where her dad ends up a hero and steals the cash and goes and <laughs> becomes the most successful young person to run a mercantile store in, uh, in the Old West. That would have been fine. And I think stuck true to the story that they set out to try and tell. But either way, like I said, not too good, not too bad. Uh, real middle of the road film. I don't think this would be acting as a gatekeeper in any rankings, but there you go. That's the old way, folks. Yeah, no, I I kind of think that, uh, you know, if, if Brokeback Mountain is the gay cowboy movie, I wonder if they were just like, we're going to make the autistic cowboy movie. Yeah, yeah. maybe. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> It does seem like that's the level of thought that they put into it. They're just like, let's just throw one one slightly off thing into a Western. And then that's that's you got a movie, baby. So hell yeah. I mean, 
Westerns are pretty much like the status quo of white American fucking entertainment for like the past hundred years. So I guess that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. <laughs> this this movie. <laughs> now, I know these stats are usually like uh, wildly uh, inaccurate because I think they're community edited. But the gross worldwide box office take for this film is on IMDb quoted as fifty nine thousand seven hundred and twenty nine dollars. It did have a limited theatrical release, so that is actually possible. Oof. It was um, made mainly supposed to be a video on demand uh, release, but I think they probably hit like 10 theaters or some shit like that. Yeah, um, I'm still trying to like <clears throat> find that information because I always like that kind of stuff, but I don't care all that much. I thought it was like a direct streaming, to be honest, but I guess not. I, I think that was the original intention, but like I said, they did have a limited theatrical release for this. I'm assuming mostly like festivals and shit like that. That's usually what happens when it's an intended video on demand deal. What gotcha. festivals what like is... local rodeos or something? No, no, like uh, <laughs> like the smaller film fests in LA and New York, shit like that. Let's see. Well, for the rest of this year, it looks like we still have Renfield coming out this year. Isn't that coming out like soon? Yeah, like next month or something. I think retirement plan is going to be this year. Sympathy for the Devil is next year. Dream Scenario is probably next year. Oh, that actually looks kind of interesting. Nick Cage, Michael Sarah, Tim Meadows. Love Tim Meadows. Produced by A24, so it's probably going to be good. All right, yeah, I'll watch that. Long Legs, a horror thriller. So I hope it's about Daddy Long Legs. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope they call Nick Cage Daddy in it. So, so what is next on our agenda? The next will... thing on the agenda is actually a rankings episode. Oh. We are in 33 movies, so um, we should have a conversation with the listener involved. Yes. Uh, as to how we're going to do this, because we, you know, we had 22 last time, and we barely squeaked out at like two and a half hours. Like, those were some longer episodes, yeah, we, we cannot we gotta do, talk. I, I think we got to do top 10, bottom 10, something like that. I was going to say top five, bottom five for each of us, as well as we each get one movie to talk about. Okay, that seems That fair. is outside of that, as well as... um. So I actually have a question for you, because I know Ryan likes this movie more than I do, not saying I dislike it, but for me, Between Worlds is my gatekeeper movie is that's like the mm. gate gatekeeper of like is this an actual good movie that i will re-watch for me it's between worlds what is it for you ryan you know i'd have to take a look at the rankings but maybe like humanity bureau like i what don't about... consider that a good movie but i think that's like the bottom of what i consider an acceptable film to actually put my time into uh, okay so i i think we're talking about two different things here because i'm talking about like is it a good like an actual enjoyable watch for whatever reason, like anything below between worlds. It's like, it could be fine, but I'm not going to rewatch it. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying, but that, anything... that might be a conversation to have during the episode actually. Okay. Cause I was going to say like, what is your movie above and below your gatekeeper movie? Hmm. Okay. I, I see. Hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely have to look at the uh, the current rankings that I have, and uh, and of course that the out. Gatekeeper movie can change. Like we watch Between Worlds, like that was like the twelfth movie we watched, so mm -hmm. we still have like a hundred and twenty movies to watch. Yeah. Also, I think I think Between Worlds is one of those ones that is is rising to the 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 top. Like uh, it is the cream of this exactly. Uh, podcast. Yeah, I, I think right. it's getting to like, the point I would call where... this the bottom of the cream. Like, you have to get above between worlds to be the cream. Yeah, and it's it's tough because we have, at this point, we've actually covered a, a, a number of straight-up good films. You know, we you know you have Moonstruck in there. You've got Rumblefish in there. You've got Raising Arizona is now in contention. You know, there's a lot to consider. Yeah. And the bottom five are going to have gatekeepers for the uh, the unholy inverted crowns because uh, we've got a number uh, that could uh, stack up there, in my right, opinion. And, 
And I'm looking at like my bottom five from last time. Like the fifth worst movie is not necessarily terrible. It's Ghost Rider. Okay, See, Ghost Rider is watchable. I, I will give you that. Right. So we have not begun to degrade ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I I have some some very specific ones. My my bottom five are mostly going to be the movies that pissed me off the most. So you're going to have like City of Angels and fucking Sunny and shit like that. Oh yeah, City of Angels is bottom five, no question. Yeah, but that's going to push some of our other bottom fives. Like I know Ryan, like, I know G Force is going to go up. Yeah, but fucking G Force is the bottom of the list for me. <laughs> See, everybody knows my next. bottom of the list. At mine is Christmas Carol. I would rather watch Next Again than Christmas Carol. Dude, I'd rather watch Christmas Carol over fucking G-Force, though. I'd rather watch G-Force over Christmas Carol. Yeah, Same. For me, it's like G-Force, Christmas Carol, Next, fucking... USS Indianapolis, USS... I think, was No, like... USS Indy's higher than that. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Let's save the fighting for the actual ranking episode. We have yes. defined a loose structure that we'll try and stick to. So, of course, all three of us are going to do our homework uh, before our next recording and come to the actual episode with wildly different expectations as to how we'll approach it. And it will be a complete two and a half hour shit show. Should be a lot of fun, though. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, hit us with the socials, Josh. You can find us on Twitter at cagefight underscore pod. Look for our next post showing before and after ball Botox photos. Uh, you can also find us uh, only if you're an uncle on facebook.com slash Nick Cage fight. Uh, but again, uncles only. But our Patreon is patreon.com slash Nick Cage fight. $3 tier gets you every single episode without any ads. $5, uh, not the $5 tier. I'm sorry. The $10 tier gets you an additional episode. The $15 tier gets you live streams. Do not sign up for the $500 tier. That is for Nick Cage only, and that is how we know he found us and approves of us. Absolutely. That's the only validation we're really seeking. here. Right. If we have one Patreon follower and it's Nick Cage, I'm good. Yeah, we'll keep doing these episodes till we die. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll find out Nick Cage's top 100 movies and review them next. Oh, God, that's going to be a weird list. You know it's going to be a weird list. I think gonna... I've got a couple of his top tens floating around because I definitely, like, was trying to justify us watching some weird shit, and uh, he's into some good shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's definitely into some weird shit, 100%. We covered a bit of that with Vampire's Kiss and his, his fucking uh, inspirations for that that role and all of that. So, yeah, there's there's definitely some uh, some juice there. Oh, yeah. I, no, am, I got I'm it. I got his that. top five at least. He likes Ooh. East of Eden, uh, Streetcar Named Desire. Okay. Okay. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Okay. Clockwork Orange. Okay. And uh, The Wizard of Oz. All I right. would watch all of those movies. Yeah. I, I like all of the movies on that list. I think I was 2001's really hoping... a little overrated personally, but I, I was like really all... hoping that like Soylent Green would be on it because I just want an excuse to watch that again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Like, I watched that, like, maybe a month ago, and it has crept into, like, one of my favorite movies of all time. It's a solid one, for sure. Like, I hate Charleston Heston, and it's hard for me to get over my hatred of him, but, like, man, that movie is fucking good. Another good uh, off-ramp for some good shit would be, uh, apparently, Nick Cage is a big fan of the Japanese director Ishiro Honda. The dude I have heard that. Dude that did a bunch of Godzilla movies and other assorted like sci-fi and uh weird Japanese horror stuff. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's that's some some Patreon episode fodder right there, if I've ever heard it. Absolutely. Also, I have a stream deck now, so uh we're gonna have some we're gonna start having sound clips if y'all are ready for that. Hell yeah. You you know I've been pushing for a soundboard. I want at least three from eight millimeter. Yeah, you gotta have the did you come? <laughs> well what i think i'm gonna try to do is fill up the first page of my um stream deck with like kind of the best hits and then the second one i'm gonna take clips of the movie that we just watched there okay fair yeah that sounds more professional instead of just us hitting the did you come button every 15 I mean, seconds. That's what I thought recording. this was going to devolve into. <laughs> no, this, yeah, is, this is not board. a Jackbox game. It's just, it's just <laughs> did you come and laser sounds. That's <laughs> <laughs> like shock jocks. It would be fun, uh, but it might get old. I mean, you got to have the air horn. You need the air horn. 
And I think if we're going to be shock jocks, you have to have like me so horny somewhere. In <laughs> yes, <there too>. absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. All right. That's going to do it. Uh, do it for us this time. Uh, check in next week for our ranking episodes. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And as always, listeners, uh, we appreciate you. Bye-bye. <laughs>